while I was thinking about this episode, I spent a lot of time just wondering what happens in a civil war that might escape the larger story that you read in a history book. I think about these things because oftentimes things are nuanced and the, you know the history that you get out of your your history books that you you know hear in class or, or in school, those tend to be narrow, simplified stories that are missing the nuances of things that could happen. And those things can escape notice, and so you, you just get the, the larger story. You know, there was a civil war here, and Group A fought Group B, and Group B won, and here we are today. You know, that's, you know, civil war stories can change, but that's the narrative that you tend to get in, you know, the history that you would hear in uh, a school. But we all know, especially if you've been listening to this channel as, as I've been going through all these episodes, that there is always a lot more nuance to history than you get in school. And that's what makes history fascinating and exciting to me is, like, geez, I didn't know that that was happening. That was really cool and interesting. It makes people a little less one-dimensional, makes history more interesting more exciting to read and learn about. And so I was thinking about what are some of the things that could happen in a civil war that you wouldn't necessarily hear, or maybe, you know, it might make the news right now if there was a civil war happening today. But when it came time to write the history books um, or the history of this or write a documentary about it, you know, two years down the road or 20 years down the road or a or hundred years down the road, these little things that might make the headlines today, you know, an atrocity here or an atrocity there, that might get left out. History's written by the victors or there's time constraints to how much we can dedicate to teaching this topic because we got to go into, we got to cover 50 topics here. So some of these things happen. So I, I was thinking in my head, just trying to create an imaginary scenario. And I know, I know um, just from seeing the, the stats, because I do see where in the world people are who follow and listen to the podcast. Don't know who you are, but I, I know geographically you're in Canada, some of the listeners are in my hometown of Halifax. Some of them are in Toronto. You're in the United States, Norway, England, Sweden. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've got listeners all over the world. And, and thank you very much for being one of those listeners. But I do know I, I have some listeners that are living in zones of active conflict today. I have some listeners uh, from Israel which is, of course, in the middle of a horrible conflict. But taking uh, another step back, I was just thinking, you know, if we had an imaginary civil war in a country today, and we won't pick any one country, but some of the things that you could imagine might happen would be we don't necessarily have group A and group B fighting against each other. You know, that'll be the main narrative that makes it into the history book, group A, group B fighting. And group A will have some leader and group B will have some leader. Why they are fighting will be over some philosophical difference in what it takes to run the country. Maybe one group thinks that they're doing it wrong so they have to take charge in order to correct the errors and right the ship. Maybe one group just wants to take power. And it doesn't matter whether it's wrong or right. What matters is that if you can take power, you should. And some of these things that might happen after 
you know, a uh, civil war breaks out, maybe it's a little chaotic. Maybe you can't coordinate as well as you could. Maybe something runs out of your control. Maybe you didn't want a civil war. Maybe you just wanted a little more power or you wanted to do X and, uh, you know, the the mob that you, you had kind of raising heck to help support you gets out of control and starts doing their own thing, kind of like the uh, French uh, Civil War, you know, the one that led to uh, Robespierre and the, the terror, that sort of thing, that kind of went out of control from the original philosophical ideas that uh, kind of had its own way, you know, momentum took things in a different direction. So momentum can get out of control of people's hands and other people who maybe uh, weren't anybody of consequence at all can somehow grab hearts and minds and get control and suddenly their ideas must be taken into account in this civil war. So you can imagine there are power struggles happening Who's in charge can be a fluid thing. You could have groups of people. You know, somebody's got control of, you know, 5,000 uh, troops over here. This guy's got control of 2,000. But the army you're facing is 10,000 strong. So you need some allies. So you might make negotiations with this other person who has control of 2,000 people to get their army on your side. So you would imagine there would be negotiation for power in exchange for support. And then you might think of, well, now that the government's kind of civil structure is broken down, we're in the middle of a civil war, and suddenly the laws of the government that's so far away don't apply to where you are. You have the ability and power to flex your influence, your laws on the area you control. And that might express itself in terms of people taking revenge on other people, people who maybe are supporting the government you're in conflict with. Maybe they're being accused of being uh, collaborators with one or more groups. Maybe there are purges. Maybe you don't like this group because there's some social difference which you think is a fundamental problem. Maybe we have different ideas of uh, religious ideas and they're in conflict with each other. Maybe we're taking a fundamentalist stance that you are either this or you are the enemy. That can lead to purges, murders, atrocities, refugees. You know, things like this will be happening. People who are philosophically or socially different may find themselves forced out of where they are, property seized. They may be tortured, murdered, arrested, exiled. These are some of the things that can happen in the chaos of a civil war, and you wouldn't necessarily know about it because, well, if I'm, you know, the guy in charge of uh, City A and there's a small family within this city that's been a thorn in my side. Maybe maybe I uh, took a loan out and from this guy, and he's trying to call in the loans. Well, I'm the person in charge of 5,000 troops. Maybe I invent a crime, and suddenly I d that guy disappears, and I don't owe any loans anymore. Maybe I'll seize property, seize wealth, seize power, these are some of the things that can and will happen during a civil war, especially hoarding of resources, food, medicine, weapons, soldiers for defense. These are critical things, supplies to feed troops, move them around. These are all some of the things that would happen in a civil war that 
might not make it into your history books. So I, I want you to keep that in mind as we go into the story today. Because the story today is written by somebody who lived through these types of events. Something that will be important to understand as we go through this is where I am getting the events that I'm going to tell to you about today is from the books called The Wars of the Jews by Flavius Josephus. And it's important to understand the context of when this book was written and some of the reasons why the book might have been written. Understanding who Flavius Josephus was in the context of when this book was written will be important, and who he was writing it for will also be important. If you were listening to me at the start of the season, I was talking with a historian, talking about the um, book of Mac or the books of the Maccabees, and we talked about how that book was literally history written by the victors. So there's a certain narrative that goes through that story, and you have to understand some of these things might be fact, some of these things might be complete fabrication, some of these things might be what would you call it, true-ish you know, based on fact, embellished a little bit. Maybe we, this little event does happen, but how it happens, maybe originally how it happened wasn't so sexy. So we add this little twist to make this event a little more sexier to the reader. Maybe we have an opportunity to somehow make a moral point about someone, maybe their moral failings, led to their downfall rather than uh, the real reason. So we might invent things like that. We might even invent conversations between people to help narrate these uh, fictional ideas, the embellishments that make a story exciting to read or maybe twist the narrative to be more positive toward one particular outcome. The Wars of the Jews by Flavius Josephus is one of those books that's literally history written by the victors. Flavius Josephus, as we'll come to see through the story, was one of the leaders in the this Jewish-Roman war. But he was captured early on, and I will be talking about that whole capture event. He was enslaved by the Roman general Vespasian, who will become an emperor. Vespasian was either enslaving or executing everybody he captured during the outbreak of this war. So Josephus had a opportunity to not be enslaved or or at least not to die and I'll talk about that better but after the war is done Josephus has uh, enamored himself to Vespasian and Vespasian's son Titus Josephus writes this book after the events have been done he is a freed man under Roman law and I know uh, you know listening to this a freed man what does that mean he was a slave and in Roman law you could free people now a freed man is not what you might think a freed man is he didn't have the freedom to just go wherever he wanted do whatever he wanted a freed man is still owing to the family that freed him He's still bound to them. He still owes them. He still responds to them. Roman law still required the removal of a lot of his agency. So he owed a lot to Vespasian and Titus. If he didn't do these things, there was an excellent chance he could be re-enslaved or just arrested and murdered. Titus and Vespasian have a motivation 
to punch up this war. Up until this point in time, for the last, oh, um, 90 years or so, give or take, there has only been one family in charge of Rome. That is, starting with Julius Caesar and then Augustus. We've had the first emperors of Rome under Augustus's heirs. The Julio-Claudian line is what they're, they're called. So that's Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Nero, you know, that, that family of emperors that we're all aware of, at least on some point. We, we know those names. Up until this point in time, these are the people who have been in charge and leading Rome either uh, successfully or not, depending on who you're talking to. But why that is, it's not important here. What's important is that the Emperor Nero, who we talked about in my last episode, the one who had to ratchet up the taxes on the empire in order to pay for the rebuilding of Rome after it burned down in a week-long fire, he's been assassinated or committed suicide after somebody, after there was a, a, a coup on him, and rather than be arrested and tortured or murdered, he took his own life. And after Nero dies, there is a power vacuum because there is no more people in the Julio Claudian line who are in line for immediate heirs to succeed to the, the throne of emperor. So what follows that is what's known as the Year of the Four Emperors. It's really a civil war erupts in the Roman countryside. This happens right at the start of the Jewish-Roman War, this eruption of the civil war in Rome. And Vespasian is a general who was sent to Judea to deal with this Jewish-Roman revolt that had just kicked off. So he's there with fresh legions to deal with this problem when Nero is assassinated and the year of the four emperors happens. And Vespasian, instead of prosecuting the war, presses pause on the suppression of the Jewish-Roman revolt and instead goes back to Alexandria and he seizes control of the grain supply and he waits to see what's going on with the who's going to be in charge and at some point after some point he decides that he's in an excellent position to seize power in Rome and that's what he does him and his son Titus skip by Jerusalem and go and deal with this kind of year, the end of the year of the four emperors, and Vespasian seizes control of the throne. And then he sends Titus back to wrap up the Jewish-Roman revolt. Vespasian is the first emperor that is not of this august line, this line that everybody up till now believes has divine blood and divine authority and is ruling because of this divinity. So Vespasian's position is tenuous. How can you solidify a tenuous position if you're a Roman? Well, one thing is to win a great battle against a foreign foe. And believe it or not, at this time, a lot of the standard Roman citizenry do not know that Judea is already a Roman province and had been for, what, 60, 90 years, maybe actually probably closer to uh, 100 years since the time of Pompey. So um, what he's able to do is pump up the battle or, or the civil war call it a great war against a foreign nation and we'll win the support of the people, keep control of the army, and we're going to bring back a whole pile of wealth from this 
in order to show the Roman citizens, you know, remind them just like uh, Julius Caesar coming back from Gaul with thousands of slaves and the wealth of all Gaul. Vespasian has motivation to do this too, to help bring that reminder back of we're in a good place now after the chaos of Nero and the four emperors. We have Titus in charge, or pardon me, we have Vespasian in charge. He's brought back thousands of slaves. He's captured a brand new province to us. He's fought this great war. And we've got all this money flowing back in after the entire city's burned down and we still need to rebuild it. We're feeling in a good place. This is Vespasian's position. Uh, but as he's getting into settling into his uh, authority, his new role as emperor, there are other people saying, eh, not really such a great war. It wasn't really that big. I, You know, it's not such a big deal. This didn't really happen. It wasn't so huge. They're trying to pick away at Vespasian's authority and his position in order to make him unstable. So this is the time that Josephus writes his Wars of the Jews. It is in response to the Roman people picking at Vespasian and Titus and trying to downplay the significance of this war. In their mind, it wasn't even a war. It was a small rebellion in a teeny province. So Flavius Josephus gets to write his history of, or pardon me, his Wars of the Jews history under the patronship of Vespasian. And he's rewarded for this with properties and houses. So keep that in mind as we go into this story that this is something that is written by a Jewish slave, a freed man, but he's basically still a Jewish slave. He doesn't really have the agency that we would think when you think of a freed man. He's owing everything he has and everything he will have to the day he dies to Vespasian and Titus. So it's in his best interest to punch up this battle, punch up this battle, make it a war, make it significant. And so just keep that in mind. Some of, you know, this is the only writings we have. And we definitely know several of the things said here happened. Some of these things will be imaginary conversations between people that try to tell that moral tale, the moral failing, whether it's true or not, we don't know. So keep that in mind as we go into the story, because I'm not trying to downplay it, but it's important to understand the context of when things were written and why the things were written and who the audience was for the book. The audience is Romans, Roman citizens, so just keep that in mind as we go into this story, that this is the background for why the Wars of the Jews was written. When we last left off in our story last episode, we had Gessius Florus, the Roman governor, appointed by Emperor Nero to Jerusalem to ratchet up the taxes and extract whatever wealth he could in order to pay for the rebuilding of Rome after the whole thing burned down. After two years of this, Florus comes up short on his minimum tax amount and decides to raid the temple treasury in Jerusalem. This doesn't go over well. It triggers many, many things. But two of the main events that happen is there is a general uprising in part by a minor priest called Eleazar. He seizes control of the temple and declares no more gifts of loyalty to Rome. A declaration of war, if you would imagine, against Rome. Yeah, we're not paying any taxes. What are you going to do about it? 
Flores reacts to the unrest by sending soldiers out. They arrest a number of people. They torture them, crucify them, slaughter them. These are men, women, children, nobles, poor people alike. It didn't matter. Whoever Flores thought was causing unrest against the Roman taxation, that's who the target was. This triggered, along with that raiding of the temple for extra taxes, a general uprising within the city of Jerusalem. At the time, Rome has a very small garrison in the city. Up until now, Jerusalem had been a very peaceful province for about a hundred years or so. So there wasn't much in the way of Roman military authority in there, and they are very, very quickly overrun when things get out of control. One of Herod the Great's heirs, or, or probably descendants, this is uh, King Agrippa II. He's the Roman-appointed ethnarch of Jerusalem. He has a, he's Jewish, he's Judean, uh, but he is on the pro-Roman faction. He's very close with them. And he feels him and his family is going to be a target, and he probably was. And so he hightails it out of there, taking whatever forces he can as he sees the uh, Judean countryside quickly getting out of control. Other parts of the countryside kind of catching wind of what is happening in Jerusalem. You can imagine how that news would travel. Somebody's just there going to the temple, giving their daily offerings, and all of a sudden there's a crowd of a few thousand people running by with the heads of the Roman soldiers on pikes. You just, whoa, whoa, what is going on? And then they said, don't you hear? We're overthrowing the Roman government. Whether that was happening or not, but you can imagine the random crowds getting caught up in the emotion of it in the oppression, seizing the opportunity to do whatever they can to try and get back some control, some agency over their life. This is an opportunity to get revenge, get back your control, cut off the taxes, get back to a good life. There's probably a lot of mixed emotions happening, people caught up in the flow people not wanting any part of it. These people that were just visiting the city for the temple offering, maybe doing some business, getting the hell out of there, running out to the countryside, going back to their hometowns, other cities, saying, there's a goddamn revolution happening in Jerusalem. They killed the the military Roman force there. They're running around with their heads. The nationalist Judeans within the countryside get news of this. They hear Herod Agrippa II is running away, fleeing with uh, an honor guard of militia. And all of a sudden, these little groups around the countryside are realizing we've got opportunity. There's some momentum there. The Romans are retreating. We need to seize control of this. If you were listening to the last episode, we talked about uh, some of these factions that are disagreeing over what it means to be Jewish, some of them responding with violence and other means of doing things. One of these factions, the Sakari that I was telling you about, or Sakari, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, my apologies, but the Sakari are all over the countryside, and they quickly get together They already have arms, and they surprise the Roman garrison in Masada. Now, if you're on that last episode when I was talking about Herod the Great, he's the one who builds up Masada in in really kind of turns it into a cultural fusion of Roman and Judean cultures. The Sicarii seize Masada, They obliterate the Roman garrison that was in that fortress. And all of a sudden, there is no Romans anywhere in the immediate countryside of Judea. And if you were 
listing when I was talking earlier about some of the things that might happen during a breakdown in authority. What happens in a civil war when there's suddenly no law? There is opportunity for people who have power to enforce that power however they see fit. And so this starts happening very, very quickly in this initial breakdown. The Sakari start enforcing their beliefs on the countryside and people who do not follow them are just killed. It's as simple as that. There's there's no, well, we'll arrest you or we'll punish you or we'll let you off with a warning. You're just dead. So there's terror happening with, by the Sakari group. They're, you know, a very extremist faction. Within Jerusalem, there is more control locally by the nobility. And they're realizing that there is an opportunity here to try and form something of a government, get organized because they are aware that Rome is a very big power. So they form a, a kind of a semi-government. You know, it's, it's kind of like the Sanhedrin, um, but a little more organized, less on religious authority and more on we've got a larger countryside to control. So they appoint different people to be representatives of them and try to gather and organize the Judean countryside into army and forces and armed militias in order to get organized, take land, and oppose the Romans before they have a chance to respond. Now the that guy, that priest, that lowly priest that I talked about at the end of the last episode, Eleazar, this is Eleazar Ben Simon, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing that name. I fear I will be mispronouncing a few names through this episode. Bear with me. I am trying my best. What's important is we understand who he is because he's a major figure in our story. Eleazar seized control of the temple. He refused to give offerings to Rome. He helped raise up that initial rebellion within the city of Jerusalem, took up arms, and helped lead the group that attacked the garrison, the Roman garrison in Jerusalem. So he is very much an early figure who is... Uh, still a priest, but of the lower order of priests. He's not a high priest. He's not in the sun Hadrian. He was a nobody up until this moment. But he is somebody who's been living under that oppressive Roman thumb. Not happy with how the sun Hadrian has been dealing with things. Not happy about how they've been collaborating with Rome. He's think, he sees things differently, and he thinks that they're not leading a proper Jewish life. They're not looking out for Jews in Jerusalem and Judeans. They're looking out for themselves, enriching themselves at the cost of everybody else. And so... Eleazar, after t seizing control of the temple, seizing control of Jerusalem, he takes his forces and goes out into the countryside to gain more followers, more armies, and uh, get some allies because he knows Rome's still a big beast. And there is an initial Roman response to the rebellion. They try to organize themselves after those initial few weeks have passed when news has gotten out, when they found out that not only did the garrison in Jerusalem fall, but the garrison in Masada has fallen, that Agrippa has 
run away from Jerusalem, everything, the province is out of control. Well, Gessius Florus, he has a boss. That's the boss who's the governor in Syria. And he gets the legate or legat. He's the head of the military forces in Syria to organize the initial Roman response to the revolt. Every available close by Roman soldier or Roman auxiliary unit that was available in Syria and the surrounding lands was mobilized over the, those few weeks and then sent into Jerusalem and Judea to deal with the revolt. Eleazar has been spending that time getting allies, getting his own forces, getting arms together. And even the forces Eleazar and his allies have been able to put together in those few weeks is nowhere near enough to deal with the Roman response. The Roman response is roughly 36,000 troops. Not all of it is Roman legionaries. There's a small portion of it. I think about six, 7,000 Roman legionaries were in the area. Everybody else is made up of auxiliary units. This is wh whatever could be fielded at that time to give a response. 36,000 should be enough. You think about it, it's just, you know, it's only a few thousand at worst of rabble is what the Romans are thinking they're going to face. And it is what the Romans are going to face, just a few thousand rabble, people that are farmers, traders. Some of them might be fishermen. You know, this is the poorest of the poor, armed with some spears, some bows and arrows, not a lot of armor, not a lot of cavalry, not a huge force to face this should be a cakewalk and initially it is exactly that the roman leader of the army cestius gallus is joined by agrippa the second and his force that had retreated cestius is not knowledgeable about the judean land side agrippa is agrippa is a kind of um, scout and uh, kind of knowledgeable about the environment. He doesn't have big control of the army, but he's an advisor to Cestius. Agrippa is also the quote-unquote king of Jerusalem, so there's hopefully some political capital he still has, some sway with the Judeans. And as Cestius and the legions march south through Syria into Judea, they meet some mixed resistance. And I say mixed because, as I said, not everybody was against the Romans in the previous episode. This is a complicated narrative of a lot of gray mixed in this black and white. So some of these cities and towns are pro-Roman. They offer up no resistance. They come out and surrender. We don't want any part of this. Some of these towns maybe were totally for the resistance and rebellion, but having no army of their own, and when you see 36,000 troops outside your city, you just go, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not part of this rebellion. That's that town over there. Those are the ones you want. So there's a mix of that that the Romans get as they're moving south through all these settlements and cities. Some of the settlements that they come to are completely abandoned as the Jews in the towns and settlements retreat away from the revenge of the Roman army as it comes through. And make no doubt when I'm saying there is a revenge that is happening. Sure, the Romans will bypass 
some of these settlements that come out and say we surrender but some of them they will just go in and trash and kill and enslave everybody in the city or towns that's happening there's a mix of this happening so you can imagine the terror of the unknown as refugees from these things are flooding your way and telling you the horror stories of what's happening so this is causing several of these people to flee to Jerusalem several of them are fleeing to Ananias and his allies to join the army we've got no choice now so this is swelling the ranks of the resistance the rebellion forces and knowing that the Roman legions are coming in their direction, Cestus and his, or pardon me, um, I said Cestus earlier, I meant Eleazar, apologies. Eleazar and his allies, they move north to try and find some way to deal with the Roman legion. They can't meet them in open battle it's way too much they will lose uh, but they know what they're good at and they take opportunities to uh, pick off parts of the roman army here and there they'll ambush maybe kill a few hundred people and then melt away they don't stick with one little um or pardon me they don't stick with one major force they adopted what you might or what the Romans would know of as the Fabian strategy, named for the famous Roman general uh, Fabius or Fabian, who opted a policy of delaying Hannibal and his army's invasion of Italy through a policy of divide and conquer, rather than face Hannibal's army and uh, be destroyed like what happened at the Battle of Cannae. Fabius breaks his army up and they melt away whenever Hannibal's army shows up and they pick off Hannibal's army in pieces, have animals saying, you know, the army's over here, let's go chase them in that direction. And then a group of forces uh, have an opportunity to pick off some of the supply train over here. You know, they, they just take little teeny bite-sized pieces out of the Roman response force. This is the Fabian strategy. They're adopting this, the Jewish rebellion army, and it's working for them. They're having some success, even though they're not able to successfully defend any of these settlements that the Romans army is coming through. They're retreating backwards and taking little pieces out of them as they have a chance to. Cestius and Agrippa are trying to... Uh, Put down this rebellion in a couple different ways. The first is open, naked aggression. And the second is through gestures of diplomacy. Agrippa sends out some emissaries who are very well known and well respected amongst the Judean nobility, reaching out under banners of peace, or at least a banner of, you know, let's talk. And trying to offer them some terms to say, you know, whatever it is we did that was wrong, let us know. We'll make it right if you put down your arms. Nobody will face further rebukes or retaliation from Rome so long as you all put down your arms. Let's just get to the table and just get to the part where we can be at peace again. Some of the... Judean rebellion forces might actually want this. Remember, there's a huge, complicated weave of emotions happening. Some of these people are pro-Roman, but they're caught up in the, the emotion and crowd because they don't know. Is, the, you know. is this guy part of that Sakari group? Is this guy openly rebelling? Because he wants it, or is he opening 
openly rebelling because he's afraid if he takes a stance of let's be pro-Roman here and try to come to some terms that he's just going to get cut down by his neighbor. This is a complicated narrative and and some of these people in the this rebellion faction are aware that this exists. They know that not everybody under their control is 100% on board with this rebellion. And so fearing that this might have some ability to take root and slow down that momentum that they have of winning hearts and minds rather than hear this request for parley that's happening from Agrippa and uh, the Roman forces, they just slaughter the emissaries, kill them out outright. We're not even going to give you a chance to put that worm in people's ears. We don't want to slow down this momentum that we're gaining because a large portion of the population is behind us but if some of these pro-Roman people know that they can take a stance, it might sway some of the people that are on the fence a little bit. So keeping a control of any way, any voice that might sway the emotions of this army, that's important to them. So they kill off the parley attempts by Rome and so Rome just keeps marching its for army forward they go all the way to Jerusalem and surround the city well don't quite surround the city but they set up at a enough distance that the city knows they're there and that they, they know that there is 36,000 of Roman legionaries out there and the time has come to come to terms with Rome. Out of the sight of Cestius's army in one big group just outside the city has the morale of the Judean rebellion a little shaky. They're on some shaky ground seeing it out there and knowing the thought that they might lose their city, and their temple. And it has them initially, um, that faction that's on the fence is able to sway the rebellious faction, that, that Sakari group, the, the group that wants to be the hardliners, to at least um, listen to Rome's offer of terms. This starts happening, and the Romans send emissaries into the city, but there's, I don't know, some confusion, some delay, maybe a little bit of taking the opportunity to try and sway the rebellion back their way from those forces that maybe wanted to get off the horse. And they're able to break up these peace negotiations and then the Romans attack the city. They attack the city for five days, and there's some battles, some people die, but they don't take the city. So rather than stay there and siege, Cestius decides to retreat back and get more forces. He doesn't have what he needs in order to siege Jerusalem. This decision leads to one of the worst losses in the history of the Roman legions against a non-Roman force. Cestius packs up his army and begins moving back towards Syria to get more reinforcements and doesn't do a very good job of defending against this Fabian strategy that the Jewish rebellion is taking on. Seeing the Romans retreat just emboldens the rebellious forces and they take an opportunity to try and harry and pick off pieces of the retreating Roman army. They're, and then in a couple spots, they catch them in disorder 
they avoid open battle, uh, but there's a mountainous region. You know, there's lots of valleys and hills and mountains, so it's hard to find good places for a big army to stay ordered and defend themselves. And there's lots of opportunity for little baby assaults to pick off pieces and fade away. And Cestius is finding his army getting demoralized by this as he's moving away. And Cestius ha- orders his army through a pass called Bethoron. Bethoron is a huge mistake. While in Bethoron, he goes through a narrow valley where the army has to break down ranks. And, and you know, they, they can't get a defensible position and the Judean forces not so heavily armed are able to surround and prepare a giant ambush in the hills and valleys or pardon me in the hills and mountainside and the cliffs as the Roman forces march through Bathoron it's a little bit like the inverse of the Battle of Thermopylae where Instead of a small Greek force holding a pass against an army of a thousand strong, it is armies thousand strong forced into a narrow pass. And while they're along this narrow pass, instead of somebody just standing there in a shield wall, there is a group of Judean rebel, pardon me, rebels on one end of the valley and a group on the other end, and in all the mountainside all around them are archers and spear throwers and dart throwers, and as the Roman forces march through the valley, they start getting hammered. A rain of arrows, missiles come down on them. They get disordered. They try to, uh, they get disordered, demoralized. They can't even use their cavalry because the cliffs are too steep. They try to rush through. The ranks are completely disordered, and the Roman army is slaughtered there. It's a huge win for the rebellion. A 36,000 strong Roman army is defeated over several week period through this harrowing but at the Battle of Beth Haran, it's a major defeat for the Roman army. It's in the aftermath of the destruction of the uh, Roman force that this provisional Judean government starts getting its act together. They start trying to take control of the rebellion and the army away from Eleazar, and his more fundamentalist faction, they and this, when I say the provisional government, this is really the nobility and the priest class within Rome, or pardon me, within Jerusalem, trying to take control of the rebellion away from Eleazar and his allies. So we, we start to see conflict, not only between the pro-Roman and pro-rebellion groups, but also conflict starts happening between the nobility and the lower classes of the Judean population. It's in this provisional government's taking over of the rebellion that our narrator of the story where we get the history of this from it comes from. That is... Flavius Josephus. He is not Flavius Josephus yet. He is Joseph ben Metatayu. Joseph is a priest. He's part of the nobility class within Jerusalem, and he's part of this provisional government that tries to take control and put order on the rebellion and try to take that control away from Eleazar. Josephus is given a chunk of the army and he is sent north into the province of Galilee to defend against Roman incursions from Syria back down. Yosef is in the middle as he gets in to Galilee. He is immediately overcome 
not only with trying to build the defenses, but also overcome with the internal culture conflicts that I had been talking about for the previous four episodes, those things which I had said in my last episode are not resolved are exploding right now in the province of Galilee. And Yosef has to deal with that as he's trying to build the defenses against the inevitable Roman re-assault on the province. Yosef tells us tales of rival figures within the province of Galilee attempting to seize power for themselves, attacking him, fighting each other. So he's forced to spend some of his army against them, do deals that he doesn't want to within the towns that he's staying at, trying to build defenses for. He's running into people that are having religious disagreements that are exploding into violence. There's, he gives us an account of where uh, a man has married a, uh, another woman in the town. They both claim to be Jewish, but because the man isn't circumcised, that's against the laws of God, so they want to kill him. Josephus has dealing with these religious arguments and... Part of the jobs of being a priest is dealing with these religious arguments and being a judge and helping to mediate these disputes. But within this countryside, there's that breakdown of authority and Josephus' army forces is limited, spread out amongst the area. And there's these Sakari and these Zealots, uh, you know, Essenes, whatever. They, you know, all these people, they're all in the countryside. And some of them are getting together and saying, well, Jesus, there's only 10 of him and there's 60 of us. Who's he to tell us what it means to be Jewish? This guy isn't Jewish. He's pretending to be Jewish. So he should be killed. It's as easy as that. It's, that's the way it is. Josephus is dealing with this as he's trying to build the defenses. So there's there's a almost civil war happening while they're trying, or at least some of them are trying to uh, bring everybody together to face Rome. And this breaks down the cohesion of the rebellion into these little factions that when there isn't a single enemy to face immediately, they break apart and start picking each other off. Distrust brews. People are murdered. You know, it slows down the work of building defenses. This is the struggle that's happening under Josephus' account, and you would imagine the same thing is happening all over the province. These are some of the things that happen when civil wars are happening, um, you know, people are taking the opportunities to right wrongs and all that sort of thing. After the initial defeat of the Roman Syrian forces, Emperor Nero gets word of a serious rebellion happening. Nero isn't dead yet, it will be happening shortly, but before that, he sends Vespasian and his son Titus with several full Roman legion, pardon me, legions to Jerusalem and Judea to put down the revolt. We got a second Roman force. This time it's several Roman legions. It's not a smaller single Roman legion and a lot of auxiliaries. Vespasian pursues the rebellion aggressively. It is the true Roman way of doing war, what they would call total war. They obliterate every settlement they come across. They enslave whoever they come across. They're out there to uh, kick ass and take names. And while they're doing that, they are raiding all the wealth that's in those settlements. 
this is a punitive expedition. They're not there just to put down the revolt. They're there to send a message to everybody else about what happens when you cross Rome. And he is coming down through the province of Galilee and running into Josephus and his defensive force that's in that area. Josephus puts up some initial resistance, but he retreats to the fortress called uh, Yopada or Jopada. Again, I'm probably getting a lot of pronunciations wrong. But there is a siege at Jopada between Vespasian, Titus, and the Roman legions, and Josephus and his force. It's a 47-day siege, 46-day siege, somewhere thereabouts, during which there's a lot of assaults, a lot of fires. There's about 160 siege engines that Vespasian um, uses to bring down the walls of the city and just lobbing giant stones into the city, killing random pop people in the population. As the population starves and gets slowly run out of water and food, they lose their morale, they become demoralized, at least one person in the city of Japata goes to the Romans late at night. He's part of the defensive forces, and he tries to negotiate with the Romans and say, look, I'll help you get into the city as long as you just kill the army and leave the families okay. Well, the Romans aren't sure about it. They're like, yeah, is this, they've been throwing a lot of tricks at us during the siege. Can we trust this? So they torture the guy just to make sure he's telling the truth. And then uh, late at night, or you know, they follow his, you know, a small Roman force comes into the, are able to get into the city through the way that they were told, and they are able to cut the throats of the guards at the gates, open the gates, and the Roman army is led into the city of Japata after again this 46, uh, 47 day siege, and they just start slaughtering the entire population. Seeing the Romans inside the city, the army tries to mount a, a kind of street-by-street street defense. They set the streets on fire with oil. You know, it's a hill. So as the Romans are coming up the hill, slaughtering people, Josephus and the forces are pouring hot oil down the street. And as it runs down the street, they set it on fire. You know, there's a lot of this happening. So it's just, you can imagine the chaos people screaming you know it's just horrible but as they break apart morale breaks down they realize there's just not enough people to defend against the romans the romans have the walls they're taking the inner city the army melts away some of them try to run try to make it away some of them um, just commit suicide a lot of them commit suicide rather than be captured Josephus and some of the officer corps escape to a hidden um, kind of a pit where it's kind of out of the way and the Romans are searching the city for him. They know he's, he's the, you know, the, the Jewish general and representative in the area. They haven't caught him yet. And as, as he's there, one of the people, again, that's in that group that's hiding with them, that person gives up Josephus and where he and the group are at. And the Romans send a force to come and take them. Now, as the Romans are there, they're not, when I say take them, they're not there to kill them. They're there to capture them. Some of the army, or pardon me, the general forces, they just want to set it on fire or just run in and slaughter everybody. But the officer corps, under orders from Vespasian, wants the Jewish officers captured alive. And so they try to negotiate and convince Josephus and the officer corps to give themselves up. Josephus 
wants to do this. The officer corps wants to commit suicide rather than be captured. And when I was doing a lot of some of my initial research into Josephus, I came across a lot of comments online talking about how Josephus convinced the officer corps to kill themselves and then he gave himself up as you know kind of a cowardly way to do it and the only account of this comes from Josephus and having read the account myself I'm trying to figure out how people came to this um, because it doesn't come across like that at all Josephus is a priest He's bound to follow the laws of God. One of the laws of God is you, it is against God to murder yourself, to commit suicide. So Josephus is following, according to his account, he's following this law. We can't commit suicide. You know, by, uh, according to him, you know, self-murder is a crime. And again, quoting Josephus, self-murder is a crime most remote from the common nature of all animals. In an instance of impiety against God, our, our creator. Nor indeed is there an animal that dies by its own contrivance or by its own means. For the desire of life is a law engraven on them all. You know, he talks about a pilot who, uh, who would be seen as a coward who, out of fear of a storm, would sink his own ship of his own accord. That's how he tries to compare the desire of the officer corps to commit suicide. You know, it's cowardly out of fear of enslavement to take your own life. Why would you sink your own ship rather than try to weather the storm. The officer corps threatened to murder Josephus if he gives himself up, in spite of these arguments. So like earlier, when we were talking about these groups of people that Josephus was dealing with, some of these people within his army are the more fundamentalist groups, the never Roman at any cost groups. This is the core of people that he's dealing with, the people that are outnumbering him right now that other times he's been able to negotiate with. He's now not able to negotiate with them. They're not listening to his authority as a priest. They're not listening to his authority as a general, as the governor of the province. He's lost control of the army. And in the desperation, the fear of uh, enslavement and retribution by Rome, they would rather murder Josephus than uh, let him follow the laws of God as Josephus saw it. And so Josephus convinces them instead of murdering him into this little suicide pact that they were already going to do anyways. They already were committed to committing suicide. In spite of his attempts to talk them out of this, again, it's against the laws. Why would somebody piloting a ship sink the ship when facing a storm rather than face the storm? Josephus wants to face the storm. They want to sink the ship. This is a moment of extreme contention that I, that I was talking about. And at this point, many people fall into one of two camps. If you're um, somebody who has some surface understanding uh, of this moment, people either see Josephus as a betrayer or they see somebody as a survivor. But regardless, um, Josephus manages to contrive this random drawing of lots as to who's going to uh, slit the throat of the other person so you're not committing suicide. And as luck would have it, or as Josephus says, through the uh, providence, uh, whether by chance or whether by providence of God, 
that Josephus is the last person in the lot, and he doesn't, of course, slit his own throat. He instead surrenders to the Romans. When he surrenders to the Romans, he convinces the officer corps to bring him to Vespasian, where he says he's had a dream from God that Vespasian will be emperor. Now remember, very early on at the opening of this series, when I talked about we have to understand that this whole account only comes from uh, Josephus, and what is the um, scenario or position Josephus is in when he writes this account. Of course, Vespasian is looking for any way he can to solidify his legitimacy as emperor and certainly a prophecy from a priest would be something that would help increase his legitimacy and maybe that's why this is in here or maybe this was a legitimate vision by God that Josephus had who knows, I'm not here to answer any questions. I'm not here to say it's this or that. All I'm here to do is ask questions and say there's a couple different ways to approach this. And so you can make your own decision, decide what you like, but I'm just showing you some opposing schools of thought on a extremely contentious moment in Jewish history as a lot of Jewish people would see it. After the siege of Jotapata, um, this is when Nero is, uh, pardon me, commits suicide. I was about to say he was assassinated. Instead, there's a palace coup back in Rome, and Nero, fearing for his own life, uh, escapes. And when he realizes he's not able to get away from the Roman army, he commits suicide with the help of one of his slaves. Vespasian retreats away from continuing to prosecute the war. He's been very successful up until this point, and he retreats back to Egypt and Alexandria and makes sure he keeps hold of the grain supply which he knows is going to be key to controlling the population of Rome. And as the year of the four emperors begins, there is civil war happening within Rome, and Vespasian sees an opportunity for himself to become emperor and seize control. He already has control of the grain supply. And he knows that there's some weakened legions in Rome and the people who are in charge. He has some opportunity to negotiate with some of them and get their support in order to take out the weaker ones. And Vespasian seizes control of Rome and becomes the first emperor that is not of the Julio-Claudian line or are the heirs of Augustus. And then they go back to prosecuting the rest of the Judean revolt. And while this was happening, there was still, pardon me, there was still this civil war simmering. Even as Roman forces are rampaging through the countryside, the Judean rebellion is not cohesive. It's breaking apart. They're attacking each other. Some of these people are trying to break away and be pro-Roman, and they're fighting the rebellion, having to be put down. Some of them are just trying to nakedly seize power. Some of them are attacking each other because of the religious disagreements. And as the Romans come back and put their full focus back on the uh, Jewish rebellion, they start harrying and destroying the countryside again taking all the wealth they can only that's not just the wealth in Ro or pardon me just the wealth in judea they're taking they're seizing it from syria they're seizing it from egypt wherever they can vespasian and titus are taking the wealth that 
wherever it's from in that region because they know they're going to need a lot of money to rebuild Rome and pay off bribes after this happens, after the seizing of, uh, pardon me, the, uh, the emperorship. And then, you know, we come to the siege of Jerusalem. But before we get there, I want to read to you what I feel is an important quote. As I've been talking through this whole episode, I've been trying to uh, reiterate to you or impress upon you as horrible as the Roman retribution was on the city side, the Jewish state itself was in the midst of its own civil war while they're trying to fight off the rebellions. These groups are fighting against each other for their own reasons. And so the quote I'm going to read to you is a description of the midst of a Roman slaughter against some civilians, which is horrible in itself. But I want to read to you the quote, and then I'm just going to talk to you about why I'm telling you this in the context of this civil war, the Judeans fighting against each other. And so, quoting the wars of the Jews now, he put his soldiers in array over against them, so that the necessity of the others were in provoke to them a hazard of battle, because there was no place whither they could flee, and he's talking about civilians here, they then extended themselves in very great way along the banks of the river and sustained the darts that were thrown at them as well as the attacks of the horsemen who beat many of them and pushed them into the current. This is describing the Romans assaulting a combination of a Jewish rebellion force caught up in the midst of a village settlement. So there's a mixture of civilians and uh, pardon me, Jewish rebels in this group that the Romans are attacking. And continuing the quote now, who beat many of them and pushed them into the current, at which fight hand to hand 15,000 of them were slain, while the number of those that were unwillingly forced to leap into Jordan, that's the river Jordan, was prodigious. There were besides 2,200 taken prisoners. A mighty prey was taken also, consisting of asses and sheep and camels and oxen. Now this destruction that fell upon the Jews, as it was not inferior to any of the rest in itself, so did it appear greater than it really was. And this because not only the whole of the country through which they had fled was filled with slaughter and the Jordan could not be passed over by reason of the dead bodies that were in it, but because the lake Asphaltitis was also full of dead bodies that were carried down into it by the river. End quote. Josephus, as I was explaining was describing the Romans attacking a combined civilian and rebellion force on the banks of the Jordan River, and they're forcing several of them into the current, they're slaughtering others, they're capturing some, and some parts the River Jordan is so full up that you can't even get into the current because of the bodies are filled at full. Where the current is heavy enough the River Jordan empties into the Dead Sea. That's the Lake Asphaltitis, pardon me, Lake Asphaltitis that I mentioned. The bodies are being carried downstream into the Dead Sea. You can imagine, or maybe you can't imagine, but in my mind I, I can imagine the horror of what that would look like standing at the edges of the Dead Sea and seeing it fill with bodies that are being pushed into it through the current of the Jordan River. Josephus says that the slaughter looked worse than it was 
because of the bodies that were already the present on the battlefield. Now he's saying that because not because the Romans had already been through there and killed everybody. He's saying that because of the Jewish civil war, the internal conflicts between the Judean groups had already fought several battles along the River Jordan and in this area. And so a lot, great many of the bodies that were already there that were being talked about happened not because of the Romans, but because of the internal conflicts of the Judean people. So there is a lament happening here, not only as Josephus, who's now a slave of the Roman forces, a personal slave of Vespasian and now Titus, a, l a lament of what he's seeing, not only of the obliteration of the Judeans by the Romans, but also the tragedy of the Judeans fighting themselves rather than facing the Romans or surrendering to them and saving the lives of the people they can. It's a very poignant moment in this story that's often passed over in favor of of the destruction of Jerusalem or the siege of Jotapata. And when I read that line, I was very moved by that. And so I wanted to make sure I took a moment to talk to you about this quote and how it made me feel and how uh, it seems to make Josephus feel when he was witnessing this. As we get to the Roman siege of Jerusalem, Titus's army, the legions of Rome, are destroying the countryside and they're forcing these rival Judean rebellion armies that had been fighting each other or at least acknowledging that you have control of this area and I have control of this area and we're not in open conflict with each other, but we're not jointly working together. These armies are being forced to retreat against the vast Roman army. Vespasian and Titus are much more capable commanders. The entirety, well not the entirety, but a good chunk of the Roman army is the much more professional force. It's multiple legions. It's not a portion of a legion and auxiliaries that had happened earlier. So it's much harder for the Judeans to implement that Fabian strategy of trying to pick them off. The Romans are much more competently advancing on them. Through sieging some of the different communities, they're forcing all the rival Judean factions. Everybody is retreating into Jerusalem. This helps put all of the rebellion in one place so Rome can concentrate their forces just on one place. But it also makes these rival factions within this uh, rebellion... Finally, they're forced to deal with each other and come to grips. And there are multiple people that are drawing lines in the sand saying, we must do this. We cannot do this. I won't step over this line. And so we have our good friend Eleazar. We have the Judean provisional government. This is led by a high priest named Ananias. We also have Menahem uh, ben Judah and Simon bar Giora. Again, my sincerest apologies if I'm pronouncing these names wrong, but these are all people that are leading some of these rival rebellion groups, and they're all had been independently sometimes fighting each other, but mostly independently running different parts of Judea. Now they're all forced together, and they all think they should be in charge. And so what happens as the legions of Rome surround 
Jerusalem, they take their time. They're not in any rush to start the siege. They just make sure that they slowly cut off and methodically cut off any way for the Jews inside to escape. And these rival factions explode on each other very, very quickly. These groups that had been independently running their own things are now forced to come to terms and they're not able to do it. There's too much personality conflict. Nobody's willing to budge. And so a war breaks out within the city of Jerusalem. And within that battle, the food stores for the city that's supposed to meant to last them months of siege get destroyed. The temple itself is attacked. One of these groups takes over the temple and uses the, because the temple itself is also a, a kind of a fort within a fort of the city. They use the defensive fortifications within that to go in, out into to the city and attack some of these rival groups. And so the Romans are sitting outside and maybe not even aware that this is happening, but there is an internal battle being fought within the city of Jerusalem as the Romans surround it, and they slaughter themselves before and even during the siege. And before the siege of Jerusalem, the plains outside of Jerusalem was a beautiful countryside filled of olive groves and, you know, trees and lots of little villages, forests, gardens, wineries, you know, it was all that sort of stuff is out there. There's a lot of farmland. And the Romans, of course, take all the food. They cut down all the trees to make wood for their siege engines and to siege the city. They clear all the areas, any place the Jewish army inside could maybe use to sneak out and attack them. And they try this methodical approach to sieging the city. And what would, what happens next would, it would almost be comical if the results weren't so horrible. And when I say it would almost be comical because there is a, a incredibly silly comedy of errors that the Roman army uh, makes during the siege of Jerusalem. The several times the Judeans inside trick the Romans and they either successfully rush out of the city and attack and kill several hundred to several thousand Romans, or the Romans build siege engines or they're building earthworks up and uh, they're trying to slowly build up a ramp that kind of meets the height of the walls so they can just basically march over the walls rather than try and knock them down. Well, they, the earthwork is uh, built up of a wood and stone to help support the earth as it goes in. So several times the Jewish forces inside uh, rush out in the middle of the night and they, they set fire to the, the uh, or pardon me, all these woodworks. And the Romans have cut down all the trees in the entire countryside, so they run out of wood to be able to continue to build this fortress, or pardon me, this, this giant ramp that they can go up and get over the walls. They try to build siege towers, and some of the siege towers literally just fall over in the middle of the night and are destroyed there, crushing some of the Roman army. There's a lot, a lot of these things that, that, you know, if you're the general of the army, you'd be like, you have to question why they would want that published because it shows how incompetent the army is at siegecraft. And yet they're also telling the story of these incredibly heroic actions by the... Jewish forces inside Jerusalem, even as they're hopelessly surrounded, they're able to do these heroic and daring raids on the Roman camp. They're hopelessly outnumbered, 
but geez, they destroy the ramp so the Romans can't just walk over the wall. They set fire to the siege engines. The siege engines themselves are falling over. The Romans repeatedly fall for several tricks, which allow them to ambush and cut off um, parts of the Roman army and slaughter them. They almost kill uh, Titus during one of these little uh, daring raids. But because the food stores have been destroyed, because of the internal conflict, their ability to put up a successful defense falls apart very quickly. Things start turning desperate very, very quickly. And at one point, they actually, the Romans actually come to an agreement with the Judeans that they allow them to send their dead outside the city. And I'm going to give you, read you a quote here, quoting again the wars of the Jews. While Manius, the son of Lazarus, came running to Titus at this very time and told him that there, that there had been carried out through that one gate which was entrusted to his care no fewer than 115,880 dead bodies in the interval between the 14th day of the month when the Romans pitched their camp by the city and the first day of the month of Penemus. Let me just reiterate that number there in case you maybe think I was misreading that or maybe you misheard it. The bodies, the dead bodies that were carried out through just one gate of the city, and there were multiple gates of the city, was 115,800 80 dead bodies. That's how many people came out of just one gate that had been inside the city. These people would have died from famine inside the city. They would have died as a result of the internal conflicts happening between the groups inside the city. And some of them would have died because of disease. Some of them would have died because of the actual Roman attacks or assaults on the walls outside the city. And they're still putting up a resistance. They're still not giving up. And the chaos that they're able to create in the Roman army is significant. They're having random attacks day or night. They've been able, through the course of the battle, to kill several hundred, sometimes thousands of Romans, but they're able to capture some of the Roman bodies through some of the earlier conflicts. They were able to strip Romans of Roman armor. So they're able, inside the city of Jerusalem, to dress up as Romans and then sneak out through some of the hidden exits and entrance in, of the city and bring out small forces and randomly come up to Roman patrols going along the outside of the city who look at them and think, oh, there's another Roman army here. And then when they come up and get close, all of a sudden, surprise, and then they attack and slaughter Jew, uh, the Roman forces. This becomes a, you know, a mind game, a psychological game they're playing on them, and it succeeds enough that the Romans are ignoring the own watchwords they're using to identify that you're an actual Roman, not somebody dressed up as a Roman. And at times, their Romans are attacking each other because they're worried that this is just another uh, Jewish assault that's meant to mess with them. But as the siege continues, the famine begins to grip the military people holding the city. You know, in, in any conflict when the siege, a city is being sieged, the citizens are the first to suffer. They're the ones who lose access to food and starve and die. And then the army begins to starve too. And as the army begins to starve, they start turning on each other and start turning on the few citizens that are still alive in the city. People will turn on each other in a famine. If you 
listened to any of my previous episodes, I was talking about, uh, I think might have been the uh, Copper Age series, when I was talking about a famine in uh, Mesopotamia, in ancient Mesopotamia. I read the, the, an excerpt from a poem, I think it was called The Curse of Akkad, describing the activities and people and what it felt like being in a famine. I also read to you a couple of letters that had been written by people who survived the uh, Holodomor famine in Ukraine, people who were writing accounts so that we all have some context of what it means to be in a famine inside a city that was being sieged. Well, the people inside Jerusalem are suffering the, the effects of this too. And I'm going to quote to you, Josephus, what some of these people were like. Quoting Josephus now. Dearest friends fell a-fighting one another about it, snatching from each other the most miserable supports of life. Nor would men believe that those who were dying had no food, but the robbers would search them when they were expiring, lest anyone should have concealed food in their bosoms and counterfeited dying. Nay, these robbers graped for what they want and ran about stumbling and staggering along like mad dogs and reeling against the doors of the houses like drunken men. They would also, in the great distress they were in, rush into the very same houses two or three times in one and the same day. Moreover, their hunger was so intolerable that it obliged them to chew everything while they gathered such things as the most sordid animals would not touch and endured to eat them. Nor did they at length abstain from girdles and shoes and the very leather which belonged to their shields they pulled off and gnawed. The very wisps of old hay became food to some, and some gathered up fibers and sold a very small weight of them for four attic drachmae. This is describing the desperation of people there, searching people who are dying for food. They're thinking these people are pretending that they're dying so that they'll be left alone and searching them anyways. They're searching houses multiple times a day because they think these people are hoarding food. And then when they can't find any food, they're resorting to things that animals would not touch. And they're eating those. They're eating girdles, shoes, the leather of their shields. They're gnawing on them. They're eating hay and grass. Or pardon me, grass. This is what's happening inside the city, weakening them as the Romans begin to close in and destroy the outer walls of the city. And as the outer walls fall, the Jewish rebellion inside retreats to the temple. The outer fortresses and the, so there's a few walls within the city, those begin being methodically destroyed and taken over by the Romans. And then they get to the temple, which of course is its own kind of semi-fortress. And over, I think, a week period, the Romans fight almost day and night trying to gain access into the temple. The Judeans inside desperately fighting a last stand inside the temple grounds against the Romans. The area is just running when filled with bodies. And then uh, somebody sets fire to the outer um, arms of the temple. The fire spreads through, and the Romans eventually, of course, take the temple. And I'm leaving this pause in here intentionally because this is the end of a period of time marked as the Second Temple Period. The Romans aren't satisfied with just putting down the revolts and burning the temple. They sack the city, they sack the temple, and then 
they get what we would call biblical. They revisit the punishment that the Babylonians put on the Judeans, and they destroy the city. They level it down. The only thing that remains is one of the walls of the inner city next to where the temple was, and this forms the uh, one of the uh, major walls. I think it's called the Wailing Wall within the city of Jerusalem today. That stays up because the Romans put a fort there where the city of Jerusalem used to be. And one wall of the fort was this wall that still stood. This is the end of my multi-part series on the Jewish-Roman War, on the Maccabee family, on the rise of the Maccabees, the fall of the Maccabees, the Roman control, and the era of early Christianity, the rise of Jesus of Nazareth, the multiple messiahs that had showed up. I didn't want to crush this into my last episode because it was so significant, so much happened. I felt it needed its own episode, and I hope I've done it justice. I hope you felt I've done this series justice. There was a lot of reading. We've covered over 200 years of history in this series, spending what I thought was an appropriate amount of time on those major points. And it's hard to say, I hope you enjoyed this series, but I hope that you found this series informative and interesting. I don't think we should take enjoyment in the uh, death or destruction of any people. Um, but it's important, I think, that we understand this period of time, the causes of it, because it's much more nuanced than a lot of people think it is in your conversational history. The figure of uh, Josephus is one that's contentious uh, between, from what I've seen, a lot of people within the Jewish community. And I hope that my uh, explanation of some of these things has helped maybe have you understand some of these things and I would encourage you if you're a at all interested in Jewish history to pick up the works of Josephus the antiquity of the Jews and the wars of the Jews and read them read them from yourself don't let somebody else tell you what happened or how you should feel or think about it Read it yourself and come to your own conclusions. Because everybody else who's telling you about this, including me, had to read these things in order to come to any conclusions themselves. And like I said, I'm not here to come to any conclusions. I'm not here to answer questions. As Dan Carlin would say, I'm just here to ask questions and show you some potential opposing viewpoints from them and you decide how you feel about them. But this is the end of our series on the First Jewish-Roman War. Next month, we'll be starting a brand new series. We'll be exploring the life and historical time and period of St. George. So we'll be hopping forward a couple hundred years. We'll be into the crisis of the third century, uh, what's known, that's a period of time known in the Roman Empire. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening there, just like there was a lot of fascinating and interesting things that happened during this period. So I hope you'll come join me as we start our brand new series next month. Thank you very much for listening. This has been an episode of the Grimdark History Podcast.